Yes, hi. Good evening, everyone. Uh, am I audible? To yes, sir. Good evening. Yeah. So, welcome to the course, the first live session also, the deep learning course. I hope you are enjoying the course. Of course, just a week, but still, I believe you are enjoying the course. Um, let's wait for a couple of minutes for others to join, then we start the session. Okay. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, yeah. So before, you know, us, uh, officially discuss about the week one questions, all these things, uh, I would just like to know about, you know, you might have discussed before taking this course, you might have discussed, the, you know, discussed about the course and the content with your seniors or whoever already taken this course. So uh, I would like to hear what are you thinking about this course? So uh, I often presume that, you know, it's mostly most of the people are perceiving this course as a difficult one. Uh, do you feel the same? Or do you want to share something? Good evening, sir. Yeah, good evening. Uh, so I uh, discussed with one of people who have already taken like degree courses. And one thing I heard in common is like, it's really difficult to even get the 40 marks. <laughs> so I am like, like it, it looked challenging, but yeah, the course uh, seemed to be interesting. So that's why I opted for this one. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. <laughs> so even after hearing the feedback, so you are taking it as a core course, not as an elective, right? Yeah, it's a core course. Okay. okay. Yeah. So I think this is a common thing. I mean, everybody is afraid of this, you know, getting marks in the quiz. Uh, yeah, so uh, that's true to some extent, but uh, let's also, you know, see what you really need to do in order to get a good mark in deep learning. Okay, deep learning is not tough. Uh, there are reasons why they feel tough. Uh, I would like to share on that as well based on the data. And then the next question is how many of you, you know, really, <clears throat> after joining this course right so you have i presume that you already completed this machine learning techniques course and did you take a look at the syllabus of deep learning and did you feel the syllabus looks quite interesting or, or in other words how many of you you know took a look at this syllabus of this course so you can just enter it in the chat yes or no so typically we look into the syllabus okay one is Okay. Okay, so few of you have taken a look at the syllabus. Yeah, so it is always good to take a look at the syllabus and see that the you know uh, I would like to say the entire deep learning uh, course is organized into three components and centered around three components. So the first four weeks deals with uh, fully connected neural network. Typically, you know. This uh, you might have said it as artificial neural network. Okay, so that we call it as fully connected neural networks here, not feed forward neural networks. The second quarter, okay, the second component is centered around convolutional neural network, and then the third centered around sequence modeling using RNN, and finally a bit of transformers. Okay, you know, we, now 
though rnn is kind of outdated still we keep it you know it's uh, you know you you can learn a lot about rnn and also you can apply it for some toy examples as well and maybe in the long run we move rnn and add transformers okay replace it with transformers and yeah so the thing is that uh there is, there are these components in each course right so you have to solve practice assignment questions and graded assignment questions suppose okay from the past data let's assume i take a look into the gaa of all the students and if i ask you this question ideally what do you expect what is the probability okay yes or yeah it's not exactly yes it could be yeah or some good grade what do you guess in an ideal case Okay, point seven five one. Okay, so the probability is for point five. <laughs> I didn't expect it's point. So you are taking a safe corner. Okay, so ideally, right? So if someone solves GAA on their own, okay. So the important component, the word is that they are solving this graded assignment questions on their own without taking a look at the available solutions. Of course, we are not releasing any solutions, but it is possible to get the solution from the previous runs you you have contact with the you know um, some friends who can give you the solution these are all possible solutions so if someone really solves all the graded assignment questions and practice assignment questions on their own and we can expect that their grade is really a, they get a really good grade okay not necessarily yes or it could be yeah or whatever okay but surprisingly uh okay let me ask the other question if i give you this what do you guess um, of course you will enter some zero okay in the ideal case but zero is quite harsh point is okay, again <clears throat> okay Okay, so this is what, uh, yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, so uh, typically this is what we really expect. Okay, but this is the real data. So I'm, I took this from the real data. So the student who got S grade, okay, uh, in the last term, his GAA or her GAA was sixty six. Okay, which means he tried to solve all the questions on his own, bothering without bothering about the solutions. Or uh, without even bothering about taking a yeah, look at the answers from the previous term, he just solved on his own and then submitted the answer. This is my guess, okay? And then after you know uh, we released the answers, he might have no come to know that he made some mistakes and he fixed it. So it says that, okay? So if you try to solve all the graded assignment questions and practice questions or whatever the questions, maybe the term questions, whatever. On your own, you will learn a lot, intricate details about each concepts. Okay, so all the questions are, of course, framed around some concepts, and if you have really good understanding about that concepts, then you should be able to solve it. Okay, the questions are not computationally in intensive, but uh, we focus or we frame the questions in such a way that we check the particular concept, whether you have grasped a particular concept. Okay, so for that, you need to know all the details about a particular concept. So when the GAA uh, or no, not GAA, the assignment questions are a good representative of the end term or quiz questions. So the one who solves these assignment questions on their own are able to get really or are able to solve the assignment questions. Sorry, the end term questions really well. Okay. Uh, yeah, Priyank. Uh, so just had a doubt that where can we get the live streaming of the video? Uh, it is in the channel, right? So in the discourse, I shared, uh, you know, in the announcement post, I shared a link to the channel. So if you go to the channel, then the stream will be available there. So on, on discourse, yeah, yeah, and discourse, you look at the announcement post where I shared the important links in the announcement post. There you can see the YouTube channel of discourse, so you can find the live streaming there, all the live streams. Okay, okay, okay.
yeah that is true okay so uh, so we have taken an enough effort when i you know when i was framing the assignment questions so i try to frame questions quite bit harder so that you when you try to solve on your own you will get the concept correct okay so that is the key so i often okay in the last two terms <clears throat> what i keep you know people keep on requesting me give me more questions give me more questions okay so after you know appearing for this one they feel that somehow they missed the marks so solving more questions will be helpful but that's not necessary okay so even if you look at i am talking from you know after looking at the data okay that's just ensure that you are solving the questions on your own okay i am keep repeating this don't make the same mistake again and again we'll learn from the previous mistakes okay so just focus on solving the assignment questions on your own and also before going to the quiz you may solve questions from the previous terms as well okay so we, we almost two terms are completed so you can take questions from the previous term and try to solve those questions also so these questions are more than enough okay of course there is unfortunately there is no single book okay so where you can um, take lot of example from like in the case of max book you can find plenty of books and solve plenty of problems but here it is not the case okay so take this as a you know as a serious note okay and please try to solve the questions on your own don't look at the answers that is not necessary okay and it doesn't mean that if you get gaa is equal to 100 okay uh, you won't get as great in the uh, in term or in the course okay so it means that if you solve the questions on your own and if you got gaa of 100 then there is a high probability that you will get as great in the deep learning course okay so that is the only thing uh, that you need to keep this in mind as far as you know the exam and grades are considered and one more thing is that typically even if you make a small mistake in the calculation the answer can go wrong and even though i avoid partial marks as well okay so if the answers are reasonable uh, if you obtain the answers by making a small mistake and you, you post it in the discourse and if it makes sense reasonable then i avoid the partial marks okay you uh, okay this is the one thing that i wanted to convey in this live session because and bonus marks of course this time <clears throat> uh, i hope you might have already read through the you know the grading policy document and where now the bonus mark is not just on submitting the practice assignment questions so the thing is that we will like you to write some code and the you know it's not going to be a complex task it's a very simple task so it's simple programming assignments okay so we will release it for each week once it is like uh, now you have completed week 1 then in the second week i release the assignment based on the contents from week 1 okay i take one concept and release an assignment and give you a due date you just submit the assignment okay so this will be counted towards your bonus mark and bonus mark is 5 so the first two assignments are going to be based on numpy which i feel you are, are familiar with and it's not uh, how much numpy should be knowing so it's not definitely if you know how to create arrays right and then make an um, operation between arrays like multiplication matrix multiplication all these things this is more than enough for this course okay N nothing beyond that i am not seeing any complicated steps from numpy it is just creating array and multiplying two arrays It's because the entire uh, subject is about ma matrix vector multiplication and doing matrix calculus okay are just a chain rule so if you know a uh, basic things about numpy that is more than you know and also i see that uh, this time the course the students comprises of you know the regular bs students and also some students from the on campus courses okay so they have opted for this course so it's a kind of uh, good thing okay and pytorch uh, i released the workshop video you can learn pytorch on your own <clears throat> uh, if you are comfortable in reading some books that's fine and also we uh, conducted an workshop in the glass term and recorded it and also made it available to you and uh, you can find the link to that workshop in the discourse post and if you are okay with that you can watch that video as well okay so i will let you know in the discourse that when what is the you know optimal time to watch a particular workshop video right so 
let's say after completing week 3 you are well in uh, you are you know good enough to watch the first two workshop videos so you can understand the concepts covered in those two videos or if you are really going fast and if you want to learn on your pace in your own face then you can refer to the pytorch documentation and it is not going to be a tough question it's not kind of building a very complex models in pytorch it is a, once again just to cross check the understanding whatever you learn in the lecture you just try to implement in pytorch by making use of functions already available in pytorch okay and of course you can put whatever you, so if you are get stuck at some point you can put it in the discourse we are glad to help you out okay okay so now coming to the week one uh, so week one is kind of uh, history and you now you know even when i was preparing this slide um, you know chat chat gpt was not there but after completing these videos you know the chat gpt thing so history is evolving really fastly and uh, often we keep on we keep on updating the uh, lecture contents lecture slides okay so i hope you, you, in the discourse you can find the link to the um, slide decks as well and if you found any errors okay so then we fixed it uh, the moment we noticed the error so please refer to the slide decks okay don't just rely on videos of course there are not not so much errors but uh, we keep updating the slide decks please do take a look at them as well whenever you watch the lecture videos of particular week okay yeah so week one is just uh, the history uh, really lengthy history and you don't really need to you know un, uh, memorize anything from this part okay do not we won't ask any questions from the history okay it is just to give you an idea about how deep learning is evolved from 1950 all the way up to this 2022 or 2023 okay and don't try to you know memorize anything from this part just focus on the next half okay where we introduce about we introduce you to MP neurons and then you know the perceptron and the stuff sigma neurons in week two and then neural networks okay and by the way uh, week one I would shortly summarize there are only two important concepts one is MP neuron so you should know what MP neuron is and how we can use the MP neuron to implement any boolean function be it linearly separable or non-linearly separable and this and also the other concept the other important concepts in week one okay so if you take a look at the previous questions in quiz one from, from the past two terms you see the questions are framed around perceptron and mp neuron these are the two concepts the core concepts where we frame the questions around okay so and once again try to learn the details okay it is not just conceptual understanding so you really need to pay attention to the details the questions are you know framed around a small small details okay and I'm openly, I mean, this is how we frame the questions and it is up to you, okay? So how much attention you want to pay attention to, okay? And yeah, so perceptron, all these difference, you know, right? So MP neuron doesn't have any weights to learn and perceptron has weights to learn. And one more, uh, you know, caution is that if you refer to some other uh, blogs or some other books okay which of course you can find it on online there are some you know uh, they follow some different notations and also sometimes they say mp neuron sometimes weights as well okay some book says um, mckella pitts neuron uh, you know has also weights associated with it but we follow you know whatever that we talk about we stick with that okay and it, it is true for the subsequent weeks content as well so you will see you will see some minor differences between our lectures contents and our notations and the algorithms and others implementation and please try to stick with our lecture contents okay so whatever we follow in the lecture we are going to follow the same in the exams as well okay so these changes are acceptable in the community so we stick with this whatever we covered in the lecture okay so that is one thing that i wanted to convey yeah so one final thing is that please post it in the discourse if you have any doubts or sometimes uh, i observe that in the previous term people found some ambiguity in questions because i mean at least they feel that there is kind of ambiguity in the questions and based on that 
they solved and submitted the answers but in the this when we appeared for the live session right so they talked i felt there is some sort of ambiguity kind of thing post uh, submitting the assignment but what i would suggest is that please join the sorry please post the whatever the once you feel anything is ambiguous you post it in the discourse we try to respond as soon as possible do not wait until you know for the live sessions to get your doubts cleared and one more important thing is that if you ask for solutions right i hope uh, at some point of time you you know even just before examination it is typical that you tend to ask for the solution for assignment question or even for quiz questions uh, i kind of follow not to post the solution step or not to post any uh, you know detailed solutions either for assignments or for the quizzes so what i expect is you work out and then you try to solve if you get a different answer and then you can post it in the discourse then i look at your steps and then i try to figure out whether i made a mistake or where you made a mistake okay so it is a kind of course correction okay so i expect whatever the work you have done you post it in the discourse and then ask the questions based on that okay okay now it's time for you so if you have any questions in week 1 or uh, either in assignment questions or if you have any general questions you can please go ahead and ask yeah kaushik uh, yeah this one general question is uh, just to understand this neurons uh, it will essentially uh, do a linear decision boundary that's the idea of so it's like uh, i mean in the case of more than one neuron for example uh, each neuron is expected to uh, draw a single linear decision boundary is, is that how i should understand it like for a perceptron if there are multiple neurons each one multiple perceptrons for example mm. each perceptron will draw a line uh, yeah yeah uh, each perceptron yeah yeah they learn a linear decision boundary but when you have a network of person tan and if you limit it to a single layer okay not more than one layer then typically all the neurons implement the i mean there is an approach in in the history there is oh, let me share the white board okay so if you have or if you are interested kind of you have some time you take a look at this network as well okay so they call it as ada line so uh, it, it is a kind of you know built on top of perceptron so typically when even if you have a network of neuron and if it is limited to single layer then you know uh, each neuron learns a linear decision boundary of course when we go to neural networks then we introduce non linearity all these things but for the time being when when we restrict ourselves to the perceptron and network of perceptron then it is always you know linear case okay and uh, is it necessary that only one neuron should uh, fire always i mean it's not necessary by design it's just that uh, it's convenient uh, for us to be able to do like for example in the xor case of yeah 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 so in the while we implement an xor boolean function we use four neurons right it's a kind of we fix the weights Right. This, uh, yeah yeah that's our design it's not necessary by the way yeah um okay. so uh, i think uh, there are some phrases the that okay. you know necessary and sufficient we use these two words in the lecture slide like itself right so two, two power right, and right. neurons are you know what you are saying is exactly right right yeah chandra said that you guys do yes sir so uh, i had one question like here uh, like in lecture videos we are using zero one right for binary mm. uh, so i was reading this uh, book that was suggested in the uh, portal the uh, charusi agarwal in that uh, they are using like minus one and one i know that concept will remain same but will there any change in weight vector and like if we take minus one one no no only the Threshold function, the decision function changes, right? So if it is minus one, 
then you have to write you know if w transpose x is less than zero then you just output as minus one uh, the weight updation rule won't change it remains the same so what will be the change uh, i didn't get it no it's just uh, this you just change the threshold function right you said one if w transpose sorry x is greater than or equal to 0 instead of 0 you said this as minus 1 if w oh, transpose okay, okay. x is less than 0 so the update yes. rule remains same oh, yeah so the this bias and all will remain the same is uh, irrespective of the, uh, the yeah. fact that we take 0 1 or 1 minus 1 yeah yeah this is true for perceptron learning algorithm if you follow this learning algorithm but if you use some sort of you know this uh, normal equations I, though it is not that part of the course, but if you use normal equations to come up with, to find the values of weights, then there will be some small changes in the solutions. Oh, okay. okay, sir. Got it. Yeah. So the weight, uh, and I think, in fact, I frame one question around the same thing, changing 0 to minus 1 in in one of the assignment questions or in the quiz questions you do take a look at that question as well so you can see how it affects the uh you know, the updation rule yeah. your single make hope single uh, so i have two questions so uh, first question is like uh, in lectures we were taught that perceptrons help us like draw linear decision boundaries is there any case that perceptrons can be used to draw non-linear boundaries no the boundary it draws is always going to be linear so because the equation itself you know we are using w transpose x right so if we expand it it, it is going to be if you expand w transpose x it is always going to be a linear equation Okay, no matter which dimension you are going into, the only thing is that we use nonlinearity just to make the decision. Okay, so it gives me W. Um, so if I have points, it always draws me the line or hyperplane in n dimension. But to make a decision, we have to use some nonlinearity. Here we are using threshold, but later we use different types of nonlinearities. So it is always going to be the linear decision boundary. It cannot draw a nonlinear decision boundary by its design. So, can we do polynomial transformation like x square or something like that? Yeah, you you can do that polynomial transformation. That's fine. Uh, like I think you already you already have done this in the MLT techniques, right? Yes, sir. So, you, if you do polynomial transformation. Um, even that uh, you know uh, it is linear in the weights not in the i mean it is linear in the coefficients okay we do transformation only of the futures so the weights remains linear right i mean yes. the coefficients of the futures are going to be you know always linear so the equation remains linear so uh, but if in the future space you if you go to you know some n dimensional future transformation and then you use this perceptron and if you you know bring it back to this original dimension then the decision boundary looks non linear because of projection it doesn't mean perceptron is learning this uh, you know non linear decision boundary in the given nth dimension if i am not wrong if i you know if I try to, if that is your question, right? So I think you are trying trying to correlate that with this question, right? Because you are perceiving nonlinear decision boundary after this polynomial transformation. Is that correct? Yes, yes. And, and uh, so one small silly doubt I have is about uh, notations. So uh, we say that WTX is greater than equal to some threshold. And yeah. then we put the threshold uh, on the left side, so it becomes negative threshold. But sometimes you just write, uh, you know, positive W naught instead of negative W naught in some lecture slides. So I'm confused whether we have to use negative or not. Sorry, can you repeat the question? So I use a threshold such a way that W? WTX. 
uh, is greater than equal to some threshold. Uh, okay, so we, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that we you so if we put zero here, right? So which means we have minus added the, the minus threshold. biases into the W in itself. It is like uh, yeah. In the examination, we make it clear. Okay, which so you just always keep in mind that so if we use zero as a threshold, meaning that we added the bias into the weight vector itself. So if I give you weight vector something like one 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 and x equal to okay just two features so you can assume that this belongs to the bias and of course we don't make a lot of confusion around this we always try to be as explicit as possible so in the exam it, you will encounter something like x equal to one to one something like this so like like i have talked later to the sign of the bias like no. is it supposed to be negative one instead because uh, you basically write minus threshold plus WTX greater than equal to zero. Yeah, it's something like this minus W0 plus mm. W1X1 plus W2X2 equal to zero. But sometimes, like, instead of writing negative W0, some people just write W0. Like, you know, in some lectures, like, it's just written W0 instead of negative. So, yeah, that absolutely makes sense. It's, you know, it's like how we see that. So, in lectures, we always get like, you know, we try to make a connection from MP neuron to perceptron. Okay. So there in MP neuron, we use this theta. And then in, in order to make this connection, okay, how this theta goes to the, you know, left hand side. That's why we introduced this negative sign. Since the sign doesn't matter. You can, you can even think of something like this, just W naught as well. It is, it is not, you know, uh, a strict limitation in the sense as if we have to always find, you know follow this minus w not something like that so um, in the questions everything should be clear so whatever the questions we frame right you try uh, solve the assignment questions and if you find find some ambiguities in the questions right so when you are uh, trying to find out the bias value whether it is positive or negative then I think that is the right place I can address this question correctly. Otherwise, it is not a strict, uh, you know, limitation of this perception. It should be W naught or minus W naught. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, if W naught takes negative value, then it becomes positive W naught, right? Mm. Yeah, Manish. Yeah, has uh, 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 we have seen. I mean, if we have uh, not uh, linearly separable data, though, then we move some kind of higher dimension, then we solve the problem. And uh, and in, here again, in the perceptron case, we are seeing. I mean, we can apply network of perceptron to solve. So, uh, the the goal is same for both. I mean, all different. Uh, sorry, could you repeat that? So, whether perceptron can solve nonlinear? Yeah, we can apply a network of perceptron, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The goal is there also to solve non linear separable data, right? And uh, in MLT, also in MLT course, we have seen for this kind of data, we can move some higher dimensions and then we can solve. So, it is but the same. I mean, the goal with solving non uh, a linearly separable data, the goal is same in both the case. Maybe approach is, approach is different, or or there is some uh, gap. I mean, what we are solving, the goal is different in this case. Okay, so if I understand your questions correctly, so if you use network of perceptron, then the goal is to solve non-linearly separable data points. Right. If it is just a single perceptron, then the goal is to solve the linearly separable. I mean, perceptron can solve only linearly separable data points even for non uh linearly separable data so we are here we are applying network of perceptron in machine learning technique course we have uh, studied kernel function to transform in yeah, yeah. and then solve so yeah so there also the goal was same right yeah yeah so in in some cases okay so not in all the cases mm -hmm. but in some cases if you do future transformation so typically the better thing is, uh, um, say, I, I have some two-dimensional data which is not linearly separable in two dimensions. Okay, 
but i apply a degree two sorry degree three transformation i move these data points to three dimension okay right. then in three dimension somehow these data points go something like this i'm just drawing for the sake again we are using a linear separation in the three dimension okay but the kernel that transform these data points may form some sort of this separation it is like now i am in 3d i am using a hyperplane to separate these data points in fact it is linearly it becomes linearly separable but mm -hmm. if we project this plane into two dimension then it kind of becomes curved uh, i don't know yeah. okay it doesn't mean uh, we are of course the problem is solvable okay so when you by transforming this data to higher dimension you use a, a linear algorithm it is like how svm also works to solve this non linear case in some cases okay but it still looking for this transformation is i mean uh, building this different kernels on our own is also tedious and it is mathematically rigor uh, if you want to correlate this with neural network neural network essentially does this kernel transformation okay so it takes pain away from us all right yeah. thank you sir yes yeah please sir in the am i audible yeah yeah you are audible yes sir in the lecture we were told that the perceptron uh, algorithm makes maximum three errors on the in for a, for a two input case we can consider a and gate uh, and function but okay but i think it is uh, it will be four errors okay so you did you check i mean you can simply use if you find the weights for okay let me draw this and function uh let's say this is correct let me draw this quickly on the and function we have four points Zero zero here and zero one here and zero here. Maybe this one one here. Okay, so we have an function. Uh, so what you are saying is that the maximum error could be four, which means all these data points are wrongly classified. Yeah. Uh, okay. So if we consider a correct weight vector. Then all will be correctly classified. But if we invert that, then the decision box boundary will be inverted. So the ones which were given zero will now be given one, and the ones which were so in that way maybe the error will be four. Ah, uh, okay. I don't think so. Uh, for some reason. So okay. Now the feasible region is that right? So this is the feasible region where I can get the current correct classification, right? So if my decision boundary is within this region, then I get zero error. So then there are only two possibilities. My decision boundary can be either in this region or in this region, right? If I if I change the values of W, then only two possibilities: either the decision boundary move into region A or region B. Sir, but just the decision boundary, we cannot guarantee the classification. We need to see the direction of weight vector too, right? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yes, the weight vector decides which direction. All this, of course, you can plot something like this as well. Uh, so, what I, I, I mean, unless you give me the exact decision boundary, I, I'm not sure why it should be true. I mean, no matter where you draw the decision boundary, right? Uh, it will. The minimal error is going to be at least one. The maximum, it at least classifies one point correctly. That's the claim, right? Uh, can you give me? I mean, if you if you found some Ws and Bs, or uh, some decision boundary, I think in the GeoGebra applet it is there, right? Yes. Sir. Uh, did you check with that applet by setting those values and see how things are classified? Yes, I did not. Yeah. So I I mean, I, in the moment I am not able to you know think of any mathematical proof for that, but intuitively I am trying to yeah. So what if we just draw boundaries correctly, like you know, and then we just draw the W vector opposite of what we want? Then I think all four of them will be wrongly classified. Yeah, that's what I was trying to say. Hmm. Sorry, what you what you are saying? I I, so, I didn't get that. So if you uh, see the plot, like and okay. we correctly draw the boundary, 
Mm. Uh, like you draw, drew that uh, slanted line, right? In yeah. between these points. Uh, if you draw that, and uh, yeah, I have bone. This yes. One that and then, is. then you have your W vector towards the negative points. Okay. Let's say I have this vector here. No, instead, so, uh, there. Opposite. That's the positive side. So if if we have it here, then mm. all four of them are uh, like strongly classified in this case. So these points will be classified as positive. positive. This point will be classified as negative. Ah, that makes sense. OK, let me you know take a deep look and then come back. Whether is there any, uh, or am I missing something, or is, is this is an accepted answer? Okay. Now uh, I know, yeah, I agree with you, but let me take a look. Sir, uh, I have a doubt. Like in this case, uh, we have uh, deliberately taken a wrong way W, no? Like the perceptron will uh, finally converge and learn a correct W, right? Mm -hmm. Like which will be in the opposite direction of this uh, W which you have drawn. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But what they are telling is that in the lecture video, I think uh, Professor. Yeah, they, is, sir, sir, you want to uh, explain that, like uh, why? Uh, at that point, I understood. Like now, I'm not getting like here. We have deliberately drawn a wrong W, right? But okay, let's say it is a... like we initialize with this W. Now we are deliberately coming up with this boundary. But it is possible that if you randomly initialize, you will end up with this boundary. So you calculate the error. It gives you four. So one thing that you know I'm not convinced is that uh, we have drawn this error plot, right, for various values of. Uh, w and B, and then the maximum value was there is three. Okay, so I think that I have to see this. You know, like you know, I have to take this offline and work it out and see whether we are getting something wrong or this is a correct line. Sir, but this assumes that um, you're doing only one iteration of the whole training, and uh, that's it. It stops, right? Only then this is possible, right? But if otherwise, if it's linearly separable, uh, perceptron will converge to the right boundary. Yeah, yeah, it does converge. But whether the so suppose the question is like, what is the maximum error of you know you could obtain with the perceptron with respect to this problem? Okay. Then will it be four? Or four is an acceptable range or something like that. So I have to check this. I will check this and get back to you, Piyush, and maybe the discourse or in the next live session, I will discuss about that. Okay. Yeah, that's quite interesting observation. I didn't notice that earlier. And also, so if you have time, you also take a look at in the recommended book by, I think, for Perceptron, there is a chapter from forget the book name uh, that is there in the site. So you look into that book. And also, I looked at the book. The maximum error was standing in V. OK. Maybe whoever watching this live session, you may expect some question around this concept in the exam. OK, sorry, I didn't look that. So I'm already posted it. Then I replay to that. Thread. Okay, so so far I think um, you know perceptron is quite uh, uh, it's a starting point for deep learning. You can say like that. So of course we are going to deviate from the perceptron learning algorithm to gradient descent, which is the engine I would say for the entire deep learning algorithm, right? So you are you might already heard about these transformers, all these fancy or uh, recent technological breakthroughs. So all these things are you know all these models learn the parameters through gradient descent, which is, you know, the gradient descent is kind of adapted, modified to learn all these parameters. So focus on gradient descent and 
try to mathematically understand how you know gradient descent actually works for a single neuron and then in week three week three is quite tough okay uh, learning back propagation algorithm is paramount importance if you are going into deep learning if you're going to either apply deep learning models build anything or even if you're going for research understanding uh, clear understanding about the backprop is extremely expect or not extremely everyone expects you okay so if you want to be a deep learning engineer everyone expects you to uh, have a thorough understanding of backprop it is not just for feed for world neural network you should be able to do that for any neural network so week three is toughest in this first quarter and you it requires a lot of time if you are struggling you have to put a lot of effort and one advice that i would like to give you here is that no matter how many lectures you watch okay or how many youtube videos you watch and how many blogs you go through please sit down break down the equation and try to learn on your own okay it is not possible just by looking at the lectures or just by going to the blog you you won't learn the details you may get convinced okay this is how stuff works but you won't learn the details you won't see the details so you know the details only when you work out on your own okay even though in the lecture uh, professor explained everything in detail but it is always good to sit down on your own and either reproduce the result or you know try to solve on your own okay so if you are good at backprop then you can get a good score in deep learning it's, that's all that's the only connection okay so entire grade is based on the way if you know how to compute gradients then you can get good grades okay okay so if there are no more questions then we can wrap the session or if, or if you have any questions i'm glad to answer that yeah Prista. so i had a doubt in the practice assignment okay the sixth question i'm not able to figure out how the answer is for uh, uh, okay so uh, can you tell me the question number i know it down the, uh, question number six in week one practice assignments uh, yes, can you share your screen i'm not able to find the link if uh, it's possible for you yes sir just a second yeah So is it visible? Yeah, yeah. Six questions. We know that boolean. Yeah, it's a kind of a direct formula, right? So if uh, so, it's just one dimension. We'll either have zero or we'll either have one. I'm not okay. able to see how we have four different functions. If could be just two functions no it is not it is an input right so when you write 0 comma 1 to the power 1 you mean 0 could be mapped to okay let me i think let me share the okay board um Yeah, so it's already answered but it's like uh, i'm not going with one now just for to make you understand what this relationship is suppose if you say zero comma one to the power two what does that mean there are four possible combinations right yes sir the input this is an input space okay the input could be four possible combinations zero 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 one one zero one one okay Okay. So the function space is here. Okay. So how many possible values? So if this is my input, what are all the possible values of the output? So for this pair, the possible could be either zero or one, right? So for each of these inputs, the output could be either zero or one, right? Hmm. So I'm first. This is one possible function. For all these inputs, the function just gives me an output as zero. So this is one combination. This is one function, right? 
okay. the other possible function is the output could all be one right right so so now then how many possible functions are there now so we can have just one okay you can have zero 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 one and zero one zero one right so it yes. is two power four four so do you get the point now even though my combination the input is fixed okay the combination is zero 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 one one zero one one but the possible functions that is the mapping from the input to the output there are 16 possible combination sorry 16 possible functions right so can you relate it to the one dimensional case then uh, yes so now i will be able to solve it okay thank yeah. you Uh, sir, I have one question. Uh, yeah, yes, go ahead. Uh, so, like, uh, when we write zero one or one zero, like the order like is different. Like, so why? How does it give a different answer? The second one. Does order of input matters in? in no, perception? order of input doesn't matter in perception learning either. No? But then, like, when we write in boolean, we take all the four cases like zero one and one zero as well and we expect them to get that uh, get us different answers like why no no in the exam right so when you restrict yourself to the boolean valued function and the input is boolean valued and the output is also boolean valued then it is possible to write all the possible inputs right but in general perception is used for real valued input as well where the number of possible combination is infinite right? but but the order won't matter like we always give the same answer even if we change the order then why do we take those cases oh, i'm sorry i i couldn't get that uh, can you give me some sort of example with respect to this um, here we have this we, yeah zero one one zero uh, and we have an and gate so order so, doesn't matter in and gate, of course, in, this is one. But is there any power. function where it would matter? And will Septon be able to detect and handle that? That there's a change in order and then produce a different output? Uh, I'm still struggling to. Uh, so, okay, in this case, right? So, let me uh, put things in perspective. So, in this case, I have only four possible inputs. And it is written in particular order zero 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 one one zero one one. Okay. And this pass for these inputs, there is one function which produces output something like this. If this is my input zero 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 one, that we call it as an AND function. Okay, so we name it as AND. For other, we don't have a name. Uh, of course, all all these things are there. But out of these sixteen possible combination, we now we are considering this. Here also order doesn't matter. If my input is one one, the output is always going to be one, no matter whether I write this in this order one one zero 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 one uh, one zero. Now the order is going to be one zero zero zero. It's just a mapping, right? The no, map. Uh, this order. Uh, see, like you see the third, uh, third one, right? Zero one, right? Instead of zero one, I can just write one. Zero. Instead. Yeah, you can put one zero, but the mapping, you know, the ground truth is going to remain same. It is going to be zero, right? Uh, no, I don't mean this. Uh, uh, I mean in the sense that when we put inputs in, so suppose I have only two inputs that I have to give to a perceptron. So either I can give one and zero, like in mm -hmm. this order, or I can give zero and one, like in that order. Yeah, so if I have perception, let's say I draw this picture. So either I can give 0, 1, and also the respective label, or I can give 1, 0. Okay. Answer now, would be same like every single time, or is there any case that answer would differ just because of a different order? No, it won't change. I mean, if you are, since you are feeding this label, right? And, and since you are, I mean, the perceptron is learning the pattern through this label label is the you know that uh, that decides the weights of the perceptron 
so even if you change the order if the label remains uh, you know different then it will distinguish the order so you seen that if, uh, order if order changes then output can change because of different weights we have uh, order changes because of different weight values for that each input yeah i would have learned this weight right so yeah. i i, I got it the, okay so the weight values are learned because of this label so we, it makes the decision based on that but it won't matter in in the one way we don't have any weights yeah that's correct yes in mp neuron the case is different and so like a last question like uh, in lecture so taught that a vector like that weight always points to the positive space like mm. i got the mathematical intuition behind it using the cos formula that so gave but mm. what is the geometric interpretation like why does it always point in the positive space no it too i mean you are asking why we are moving all the points to the positive space no why the weight vector points to the uh, positive space on this no that is the restrict right so in the perceptron learning algorithm mm -hmm. uh, just to come up with the solution what it's just a clever way of doing you know coming up with the solution oh, oh sorry i'm not this i'll delete this so instead of having two update rules okay so typically what what we are trying to do is that i draw a boundary and then points are scattered here and then i have to maintain two update rules based on the points right i mean whether it belongs to class 0 or class 1 so the clever idea is that i know uh, if i move these points to one side okay so how do you move you just negate the point so they everything will come here okay so unfortunately let's see this is tall and this is cross okay now i moved all just by negating all the negative points i moved it to the positive half space okay then whatever the decision boundary that i am uh, if i learned the decision boundary with respect to this weight vector for all the negated points right that is p prime i guess he used i don't know what is that uh, the union of positive points and as well as negative points okay now since i moved all these points to this space now coming i mean learning becomes easier the rule becomes easier that's the reason why they are moving it to there and since i know that since uh, all the points are lying in this half space and the angle is not going to be you know never greater than 90 degree it is always going to be less than 90 degree so i can restrict the search space it's kind of clever idea that's what i see does it make sense yes it is like you are cutting off the other half altogether you need not to look at the uh, search for you know w by keeping that space as well yeah govin yeah hi uh, good evening i have a question about uh, the excitatory inputs and the inhibitory inputs so in the lecture uh, mm. it was uh, you know it was just defined what is a inhibitory input that if any of the inhibitory input is uh, is on mm. then um, the output will be zero right so yeah. is is there only is there something more to it because the way the questions are formed around it are um, you know are more uh, you know thought provoking so is there more that we have to understand about them in the practical sense uh, while you know designing the neural networks and uh, realizing the functions or is there any references that you can point us to to understand more about that uh, those inhibitory inputs yeah so inhibitory inputs so if you are talking from the neural networks point of view that we are using in the practical world in in 
in the past decade or in even in right now now people are not focusing on this inhibitory inputs in any of the neuron okay because the moment you put everything as a learning so in mp neuron we, the, there are no weights and there is nothing to learn so inhibitory input is helpful to learn some functions okay because we are manually doing that that's how in historically people did so if you want to implement this input you better you know to get some output you better turn on this inhibitory so you will get that particular output so that's the reason beyond that there is you know i i'm not seeing any reason to have this inhibitory inputs in any learnable uh, you know scenarios like in the perceptron or neural network or whatever that is learnable then there is no need to have this inhibitory inhibitory we are manually turning it off but in learnable we ask the based on the data if you want to turn it off you turn it off but we don't explicitly say this is an inhibitory input okay so uh, to solve the questions around them right mm -hmm. there is a one question in the pra, you know practice assignment and one in the graded assignment uh, is there any technique that we have uh, to uh, specifically to adopt to solve these kind of uh, you know manual uh, design uh, tasks with inhibitory inhibitory inputs uh, no so the the concept is that no matter what my input the moment i turn on my inhibitory input all those input has to be ignored okay so the output has to be zero so this is the requirement so i think if i remember correctly in the assignment questions when i frame this it is like okay conceptually it is fine then how do we implement uh, suppose let's say i want to implement mp neuron in coding and how do i implement uh, this inhibitory input of course you can use if and else conditions but i just wanted to use that is one way of doing that you just use if and else then if inhibitory input is on then you just return zero as an output ignore all the inputs but mathematically also you can express the same so uh, once you understand the concept and if we ask some question around this implementation aspect you just work it out the details so in the summation you see some symbols you just expand and work it out then you will get it and that's what i'm also saying right so the, one of the thing things that i commonly observed in students is that the moment they see equations they get stuck okay for some reasons but it is always going to be some summation symbol and some index notations but if you expand it out then you see things and you substitute the values then everything disappears it is just a simple addition and multiplication so that's all to the inhibitory inputs so you understand the concept and understand how to implement it in different ways so we have given you two ways one is through equations the other is of course in writing you can write if and else condition there may be other ways to implement the inhibitory input as well but it has to satisfy the requirement okay go ahead yeah. okay maybe in the next uh, week we will still have a lot of uh, questions and please do explore this GeoGebra applets. So if you get stuck at some point, especially when you learn Taylor series, uh, I don't know. So whether Taylor series uh, is covered in any part of the course in math or MLT or it is something new to you? No, no, I think it was covered in uh, math one or uh, I think math. math or math. Math. Uh, Okay, then it's fine. So if it is new, then you can explore this applet. Okay, so the applets are designed to, uh, you know, so that you get some good intuitive understanding about whatever that you are learning. Okay, then thanks a lot for joining this session. It was really kind of interactive. So in all the past two terms, this is the first time that live session gone beyond one hour. Okay. So, so every Saturday we will have a live session. Yeah, yeah, every Saturday from seven o'clock onwards. And yes. it is always streamed under this YouTube channel. So you can in case if you miss it, you can watch it in the channel. I think this time we will uh Shini was in here, so definitely yeah, we'll take it beyond one hour if it's okay with you. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's quiet today, but uh, next week I'll be more
yeah, yeah. sure so just uh, if i can discuss uh, the ask you to discuss on the fourth question and the practice assignment about that uh, you know whether all boolean functions can be implemented using excitatory inputs so there are four or three options there mm. uh, so why the option that um, why it is true that we cannot uh, you know implement all boolean functions uh, mm. independent of whether they are separable or not if it is separable we can implement any boolean function right uh, with excitatory inputs i think uh, this all function doesn't work right xor if i am not wrong no no if it, if it is linearly separable if that is the condition then any boolean function could be implemented by excitatory inputs right uh so the fact is that we can't generalize that's the problem even today right um, uh -huh. still we don't know how many linearly separable functions are there if we move just n beyond 9 or 10 correct correct oh. see if we do not know before hand that it is linearly separable mm. then we cannot make a statement that any boolean function can be realized with excitatory inputs but yeah if we know prior hand that it is linearly separable Mm -hmm. then can't we make a statement that it can be realized with excitatory inputs if it is linearly separable is the precondition ah uh, yeah that i am not sure about i mean we Because have to... this, the statement is it is true that we cannot implement excitatory with excitatory inputs uh, some boolean functions independent of whether they are linearly separable or not okay how can so... we make uh, that statement that it is independent of linear linearly separable separability is a condition on which we make a we can make a statement that it can be realized right because yeah. even even in the in the in the the two layer i know what you call um the perceptor and algorithm itself it's on the assumption that the pers the algorithm would converge provided the input is linearly separable right yeah that is for perceptor yeah right so how this uh, the answer yeah, is yeah. So the, uh, the 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 question number 4 uh, hmm. what is the right answer for that uh, can you share this screen because uh, get some yeah okay i have to take a look at the questions so if it is possible you share it otherwise i have to look for the code scene yeah, sorry i'm not able to share uh, yeah, it's all right if anyone can share uh, because i don't have shareable option so i still have it open i'll just share it again yeah yeah please do that so i should have opened this page but somehow i forgot it yeah the further is the, the answer is given as uh, option 2 mm okay so when we go for so is, yeah only is it only ex using excitatory inputs is that the uh, catch or i'm not i didn't not understand this yeah in the sense that uh, there are some boolean functions uh, which requires you know as far as this mp neuron is considered there are some boolean functions which requires excitatory input in order to implement them correct uh, as in the case of spus pointed out the not gate requires this uh, you know this inhibitory input in order to implement it correct uh, but, but I, inhibitory uh, is not there we are we are talking about excitatory inputs only yeah, yeah we are saying cannot be implemented only using excitatory input, which means we need inhibitory input in order to implement a function that's the meaning right for some boolean functions we need inhibitory inputs in order to implement it using mp neuron that is you can rewrite the statement like this okay but uh, somehow i am not able to recall why i used this word uh, linear separability into this picture if the functions i mean in order to make this claim true we have to come up with uh, linearly separable function 
and also show that mp neuron is unable to do that without this inhibitory input in okay at least what are the what is true related to uh, so we are we are actually putting in multiple terminologies right we have a terminology called we have types of inputs uh, you know excitor inputs and uh, inhibitor inputs yeah. and there is uh, linear separability and uh, non linear uh, linear inseparability and uh, we have uh, so and we have realization of functions right so in this context so inhibit uh, so what is what is the what are the right statements to make one is like uh, so are you are we saying that um, though it is linearly separable uh, in order to realize any linearly separable function at some point in time we should be using both excitatory and inhibitory inputs to realize them is that the right statement i mean uh, no so if uh, not get there, there is no excitatory input it is always uh, i mean one excitatory one inhibitory input is there right or not get mm -hmm. i mean uh, the question if i think correctly uh, you know this statement says that the all boolean functions so when we read this word all boolean functions mm -hmm. now we are generalizing this okay independent of whether in what is the dimension of the input we are saying all boolean functions mm -hmm. cannot be implemented only using excitatory input so which means there are some boolean functions which requires inhibitory input at least one inhibitory input okay th that's what it implies right i am trying to phrase this in a in this way as well so if i say the st the statement that there are boolean functions which can be implemented only with inhibitory inputs there are boolean functions which can be implemented only with inhibitory inputs okay so if i make uh, that statement so is there a boolean function that requires only inhibitory input so what is the case for not um, i don't have this lecture slide with me now but if it is linearly not separable then anyway we cannot realize right why are we saying whether they are linearly separable or not now that's what i'm wondering so why i use this word lin when i frame this questions now that i'm not or otherwise how i made this statement linearly separability into the picture so okay i take a look into the yeah actually this actually prompted me to think is there something more to discuss about this inhibitory excitatory uh, concept other yeah, yeah. than what we discussed in the um, in the lecture because lecture professor said that okay uh, this is what i wa i want to say other than that i do not want to say anything else okay and he yeah, made yeah. a statement and he said that okay uh, if it is inhibitory then uh, output is going to be zero other than that uh, i do not want to say anything more Means, yeah, yeah. is there something more that we have to understand about this was the question that i had uh, when i when i got this question wrong by using no, no nothing more i mean i just framed this question just to emphasize if i remember currently emphasize that uh, some boolean functions requires inhibitory input in order to implement it mm -hmm just to you know you you might have questions in your mind why we use inhibitory input why don't we just do go with just excitatory input why we come up with these two different terminologies just to emphasize that i framed this question hmm. i think beyond that because we don't even have good understanding about this linearly separability for n greater than 8 right hmm. Hmm. we don't know how many functions are there that are linearly separable so if we don't know that then there is no use in talking about this inhibitory input in a generalized manner mm -hmm. yeah yeah but i am still wondering why i use this linearly separability into the picture okay but it is nothing to do with i mean that's all about the inhibitory input that i know what okay. is inhibitory input and then why we need it uh, especially for mp neuron and mm -hmm. how do we implement it if you really want to implement inhibitory input we can go with this coding part or this math part that's the thing i know and yeah. of course i won't ask anything beyond that in the exam as well okay so yeah thank you yeah thank you
okay thanks thanks prasta for sharing the screen and thank you everyone for joining the session see you in the next session please post the questions in the discourse i am expecting more questions and also thank you sir uh, follow the discourse questions as well sometimes i see some questions that are quite interesting then based on that i frame questions in the quiz and in the so if someone follows the discourse every day every question right then maybe they have a better chance of answering some questions in the quiz and in term okay yeah, yeah sure thank, thank you thank yeah you. bye bye thank you, thank you sir yeah thank you sir